Good morning, everyone. I'm JJ, you're watching Reality Survival. So today I thought I would just make a rambling driving to work video. <laughs> Not really sure what this is gonna be about. Well, maybe I know a little bit about it, but what I'm gonna talk about. But uh, I, I saw a video from uh, uh, Joe Fox and the Viking Preparedness Channel this morning. And uh, I, I like him. He seems seems like a seems like a good guy. I've never met him in in real life, but uh, seems like a good guy. And he was talking about uh, sort of what he's been doing, you know, to get ready, you know, and all that. And, uh, it made me the early part of this video made me think about. Uh, he was talking about Christian preppers who, you know, they they talk a lot about like. Jesus is going to save me, you know, and, and I, so I kind of, the idea is, is that they don't need to worry about anything because, you know, they'll be taken in the rapture or they're not going to stick around or, you know, whatever the, whatever the case may be. And it reminded me a lot of those people that he was talking about, it reminded me a lot of uh, Saudis when I was in Saudi Arabia, my first deployment in 2000. Uh, I learned the term <laughs> inshallah which basically means if God wills it and they they literally these these folks over there they live their lives based off and around the concept of inshallah if God wills it what do I mean well I mean that they're, they're willing to take a left-hand turn from the right lane during a red light just because inshallah <laughs> or you know they're 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 willing to pass you at a 170 kilometers an hour <laughs> or however fast that is on you know on, uh, in in miles per hour in the right lane with three lanes of traffic you know um inshallah like what you know god wills it they'll take me you know and <clears throat> We look at that as Americans and just say, that's reckless. That's crazy. Why are you driving that way? You know, the, the turn thing, we call that the Saudi sweep <laughs> when we were there because you'd see these guys, they do it all the time, man. I mean, it was just, it was constant. And to me, when I see that sort of, those sort of, of actions, and this isn't an anti-Muslim thing, it's just, just a different way of life and a different way of processing, uh, you know, information or whatever. It doesn't make any sense to me. I think that those people are crazy. And I'd say the same thing about people who, who have the feeling, um, that something's not right in society, that somewhere along the way, as we've moved to and into the fourth turning, which is where we're at now, um, something broke. And it maybe it may have broken worse than it ever has before because of a variety of factors and converging cycles and all that kinds of stuff. And so you have this voice in your head. I know you have it because you're watching these videos. And it's telling you, you need to do X, you need to do Y, you need to do Z. And you're not listening to it. And you're like, inshallah, if God wills it, you know, well, it'll be okay. We'll, we'll figure it out. You know, your normalcy bias is, is fighting back against that little voice. And, you know, it's, it's, it's healthy for a society to have normalcy bias. It perpetuates normalcy, right? Um, but it's also healthy for, for there to be those people without normalcy bias, which is what preppers are, or catastrophists, or whatever, whatever responsible citizens, or <laughs> whatever you wanna call us, right? And you really should listen to that little voice. Whatever it's saying to you, maybe, you know, 
who, who knows what it is for you and your situation. It's difficult to say for sure, but I, I would encourage you to listen to that and to take steps to move it, uh, you know, to, to, to move in the right direction, to move in that direction and, and, and have yourself a little bit more prepared than you were last week or the week before or whatever, you know. Um, the, there's, a, there's a pretty good chance that that voice is saying something to you for a reason. You know, um, if you're not Christian or if you're atheist or whatever, maybe it's just the universe, the collective universe is telling you, you know, you can, you can phrase it however you want. You, you can, you can use whatever terminology you want, but everybody knows what I'm talking about. You've got that little voice. It's like, man, I really should be doing this. I would, I would just encourage you to, to look at that and, and make an assessment of figure out how you can get there. You know, don't focus on the reasons that you can't do something. Focus on how you can get there. Like in the military, that something that I've learned as a young survival instructor with the Air Force was how, how do I get to yes, right? Like, I don't care about your excuses. It doesn't matter to me. Whether you're too old, you're too poor, you're too whatever, none of that, none of that matters. Everybody's circumstance is what it is. You're not gonna change that per se, unless you develop a plan to change it and to do it yourself. And you can, there's a lot of things you can do that are within your control. You're in the country that has, even though as effed up as we are, you still have more opportunity here to change your circumstances than you do anywhere else in the world. Um, you know, the, a, a big one that I hear all the time that people talk about, well, I'm, I'm on fixed income. I only make a certain amount of money because I'm disabled or uh, cause whatever, you know, like, and there's probably some circumstances where people have a hard time and I get that, right? But there's definitely things that you can do even as a disabled person. You know, you can watch people's cats, you know, if you have a cat of your own or you can uh, watch people's dogs, you know, using like the Rover app or something like that. Or, you know, maybe if you're not disabled, you can go and you can uh, pick up people's junk as a side hustle. You can drive an Uber if you've got a car, you could, you know, or Lyft. Uh, you can de deliver medical, pick up medical packages and deliver them if you don't like dealing with people, you know. Um, you can do food deliveries, all that kind of stuff. I mean, there's there's just endless list of gig economy kind of side hustles that you can do. You can resell, you can do retail arbitrage where you buy at one location and sell on Amazon or Etsy or whatever someplace else, you know. you can. You can go and uh, find junk stuff at, at garage sales and flip it and sell it on eBay and, and, and Amazon and other sites you can, or whatever, you know, like there's, there's, a, there's a ton of different things that you can do to make some extra cash and, uh, you know, better your situation. I do it. I make, I make a decent living. Um, but and you know, my full-time job, but I still have several side hustles, you know, where I'm bringing in extra income, you know, per year. And everybody should do that to a certain extent. And especially if you find yourself on a fixed income or in a situation where you don't have enough income or whatever the case may be. I mean, you should, you should absolutely look at that, figure out ways to, to do other things. And maybe if it can't be, you know, regular paycheck, then maybe it can be, you know, barter, or maybe it can be trade for services or whatever. I mean, just the whole, woe is me. I can't do anything. I, you know, that, that attitude. Well, that, that just means that if you just believe that you keep following that down that road and you're going to be stuck and you'll have a lot of regrets and 
you know, you, there'll be circumstances that'll develop and you'll hear that little voice go, man, you should have done X. You should have done Y. Now you're hosed, <laughs> right? So the reason they have the voice is to give you some time to do something about it. You know, it's, it's the, it's, it's your, your subconscious, your spirit of God, the, whatever you want to call it, uh, you know, the, the voice in your head, what, whatever you want to, however you want to refer to that. Um, I mean, I think it's God prompting you. I think it's, I think it's, you know, um, that's what I think it is. But if you don't listen to it, if you ignore it, if you continue to push it away, uh, you'll just, you'll regret it at some point, <laughs> you know? So do that at your own peril. Ignore that little voice at your own peril. I've, I've not ever really, I'm trying to think back. I mean, I've been into prepping in one extent or another since about 2000, since I, since I got back, um, I think that was a little bit before I started, started a little before and my parents or my grandparents were sort of non-label preppers. You know, they, they, they grew up during the depression time frame. Um, they were young, they were young, uh, during the depression, but they, they had that lasting memory and always had food in the house and always, you know, just, just sort of the way people lived back as responsible citizens, um, you know, back then, but I, I can't think of anything that I've done related to prepping where I've ever later been like, oh man, I shouldn't have done that. You know, it, it's, uh, it's always given me a sense of, of, um, relief and I've always felt good about it, about what I've done or what I've spent money on or what I, what training I did or, you know, whatever the case may be. Like, I don't, I, I can't think of any time when, you know, I was just like, oh, this is awful. So I would just encourage you to listen to that voice. Get get up, get going, get busy with it. Do what you're gonna do. You know, make a plan, start small. It doesn't have to be, it doesn't have to be hard. It doesn't have to be, you know, I have to move off grid. I have to, to buy a land and build a cabin and be completely off grid, right? Like that's not, you don't have to do that. Um, it, it doesn't have to go to that level, but you could, if you, let's say if you live in a big suburb right now, you know, which is like most people live in, in, in big suburb, suburban areas somewhere outside of a larger city, you know, maybe you're in a, in a, you know, satellite city somewhere outside of a big area or whatever. If you're say, oh, I don't know, you know, 30 minutes from being in the heart of that big city, I'd say you're probably too close personally. Um, I, I would, I would want to be, if it, if it were me or the way that I, the way that I go about finding land when I move is I want to be at least an hour outside of a big city. So for example, we're, um, we're probably, I don't know, an hour and a half to two hours outside of Boston, which is the closest big city up here in New Hampshire and in our, in our area. Um, and then you've got Concord, which is the next biggest city, which is a small city. It's not, it's not massive at all. Um, and we're 30 minutes outside of that at least. And then we've got a small town, you know, that, that we live, uh, that we live in that we're probably five miles outside of that, you know? So that's sort of the way that I go through the process of, of processing how far away I want to be from like where all the people are and everything. I mean, in some areas you don't really have the luxury of, 
living in an area where there's no population density. But you can use a population, if you have the option to move, you can use a population density map to help you identify the counties that are, that are gonna be better for that. Um, but like I was saying, even, even if you just moved to where, if you're 30 minutes now, if you move 30 more minutes out, if you move an hour outside of a big city, you're improving your situation dramatically. And then if you can get, you know, into a smaller town, like a, a town of four or 5,000 and, and buy a house that needs fixing up inside that, inside that town, that is still way better off and way more secure than a town or than a, than a house that is in the suburbs surrounded by 60,000 or 70,000 people. You know, if you, if you can situate yourself a little bit further outside of that big city into a little town, even if you're not in the woods, you're, you're still improving your chances dramatically, you know? And then you get that house, you start working on that, you start meeting your neighbors, you know, because anytime you move in is a perfect time to get to know your neighbors. It gives you a reason to just stop by their house and introduce yourself and say hello. People actually do enjoy that, believe it or not, still. They like to know who the neighbors are. They don't like it to be mysterious. Um, and your situation, just, just off of that one thing, is, is going to change dramatically and it'll probably cost you less. Your, your house might not be as nice um, and it might not be as big. Maybe you'll have to do some work on it or whatever, but you're, you're improving your chances of getting through whatever craziness comes our way a lot. And you're gonna lower your stress level at the same time because traffic's not gonna be as bad. Uh, you might have to drive a little bit further or whatever, but you know, you again, you can do that strategically. You can try to find the, the, the cross flow of traffic, right? You can buy in an area that sees the, the majority of traffic at the, the opposite times on when you go into work and stuff. Um, if you look at the, the flow of traffic, that's fairly predictable and you can figure out, okay, you know, if I live over here, I'm not gonna have as bad a commute in as if I live over here. Right, every 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 place, every major city, all that they all have um, traffic patterns, and and you just want to live opposite of the main flow, and then you can increase um, your uh, you can your commute will be more efficient, basically. So, just I just listen to your voice, you know, listen to that little voice in the back of your head that's telling you you need to move. Or, you know, you gotta buy a piece of property. Maybe it's just, maybe you're gonna keep your current house and you're gonna buy a piece of land somewhere. You can do that for, I mean, you can still get land in lots of places for, you know, three, $4,000 an acre. I mean, in some places you can find it cheaper, but um, there's, there's quite a few places where you can find it relatively, you know, relatively cheap and, you know, two acres surrounded by national forest or, or bordered by national or state park or, you know, something along those lines, that might be perfectly doable as a good bug out location. Um, and then you can, you can start slowly building, you know, structures there and stuff like that and try to move out there full time you know you can do it in stages buy the land first get all your permits and everything then start working on you know building something small don't don't make it big you do a tiny house you could do you know whatever my point is is that there are more opportunities here in the united states than there is anywhere else in the world you just have to look at your situation you got to come up with a plan and then you got to start executing. You know, you have to be a doer. Like I was talking to my son the other day and dreamers, dreamers are great for ideas, right? 
you know, you everybody knows a dreamer, right? You've all you've all met people who've got lots of ideas and they're going to do this and they're going to do that and they're going to do this. They don't have any actual real ability or intention of actually executing on anything. Because if they did, they wouldn't be known as a dreamer, they'd be known as a doer. And that's kind of what I'm trying to say here is don't be a dreamer. Don't just sit and think about these things. Don't pontificate on things. You know, get up and get going. Start the process. Make the mistakes. Do the things. Like you'll learn and then it'll be better the next time. And then you you know, it'll be better the next time. Like you have to get in there and start making the changes. If you don't, you're gonna regret it. And that little voice is gonna be go, man, you should have done this. And then it's gonna be too late. And then it's over. So, that's the video for today. Hope you enjoyed it. Hope you got something from it. Um, if you guys didn't know, I have a cell phone app called American Prepping Academy. You can download it on Google or the Play Store. And we've got, it's a collaborative app with 15 other channels. And what it does is it notifies you within the app. It's not always dinging at you, telling you to look at the app, but when you want to watch prepper videos, it'll tell you, hey, this channel has got a new uh, video up, you know, because the YouTube algorithm doesn't, doesn't show videos to anybody, hardly ever. And so we developed this app to help get around that problem. So go check that out if you want. And better than that, don't forget to live the six Ps. Proper prior preparation prevents poor performance. Stay safe.